Welcome to the therapeutic session of the conference. And uh, this is the therapeutics and pharmacology session. And our keynote speaker is Virginia Fate from Texas A&M University. And um, she's a proper pharmacologist, isn't that right? <laughs> yeah, okay. It's always good to have at a, a meeting like this uh, before she turned into the veterinary area. And she's going to talk about um, veterinarians and how they prescribe an evidence-based um, prescription of drugs. Okay, so if we could have the IT working on the slides, please. Good morning. Hey, I I do I walk around a little bit, so that's why I want to ask for the mobile mic. So uh, hopefully I won't hypnotize anyone. Actually, that might be a good thing. So um, this is the last day of the conference. Everybody have a good time. It's been a great meeting, right? <coughs> Everybody enjoying Dublin? Good. <laughs> Me too. My family and I came last week. Um, we went down south to the southwest and. It's beautiful here, beautiful. I want my son to come back when he goes to college and do some study abroad here so I can come visit, so. Uh, so, <clears throat> I thought I had the shortest title, but I do not. The shortest title is Mike Collins' title, which is Paratuberculosis. So, in 45 minutes, we're gonna talk about therapeutics and pharmacology. Actually, I'm just gonna hit on a couple of um, high notes, and um, some of you, Do I need to point down there? It's the middle in the, in the green. No, no, to turn the, push the, push to the go path. forward. Isn't it that? I just didn't know if I was pointing the right way. Okay, we need some high <laughs> IT. <laughs> Hello, it's me. You have to move the slides. Is, is there a way to, all oh, right. So some of you um, probably had, um, pharmacology instructors who were, I'm not really a proper pharmacologist, thank you for that, but um, I'm a, what you call a clinical pharmacologist. Um, I was intrigued by, um, was anybody in the food animal education session the other day? And um, <clears throat> Dr. Constable was talking about the model of teaching food animal um, skills and so on, and he talked about the, the species specialist who then became something else as opposed to the something else that then became a species specialist, right? So the pharmacologist became a bovine specialist, and the, the, the better way is to do the bo be a bovine specialist first and then become a pharmacologist. And I did, actually didn't do either, so <laughs> I, um, I, I, I did some academic practice, what we call it. I did an internship, a food animal internship, and got really interested in cattle. Um, and then I went to graduate school and did clinical pharmacology in cattle. And I think the model of most clinical pharmacologists is they are species specialists and then get interested in pharmacology, which is, um, in my mind, how it should be. Um, but many of you probably uh, slept through most of your pharmacology sessions, or you up, uh, pumped and dumped, right? You memorized a bunch of words and mechanisms and, and went, well, now I passed the exam and now I'm, I'm done. I don't need to remember any more pharmacology. So um, in medicine, they'll tell me what I'm supposed to treat with. So I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna provoke hopefully a little bit of thought today about how you make decisions about drugs. Some of you, most of you are probably already doing most of these things, um, but I, I'm hoping to help you think about it systematically. Um, this is um, the temperature in, in my hometown today. So body temperature, perfect for, um, and I'm enjoying Ireland much more than, so uh, 25 is the lowest it'll be the rest of the summer, so. I'm from New England originally, so this weather suits me a lot better. So, um, so just a couple of my main focus today. Um, I think veterinarians should be thinking about how they make decisions about drugs, and not just saying, "Well, I saw this disease, and therefore this is the this is the therapeutic I'm going to choose." And then the other thing is, pharmacology actually is a little bit important. So. Maybe you didn't learn it in your pharmacology course when you were in vet school, um, but I'm hoping that you'll see some of the important pharmacological principles that you should be applying, thinking about um, on a daily basis, including a, at least one or two things that are specific to cattle. So um, this is what I'm talking about. The um, Let's learn all the drugs. That's the most important thing. And then we'll think about the cows. Um, and whereas I think a better model is Let's start with the cattle. What is it that we're trying to do? What's the alteration in the patient? What's our therapeutic goal? 
do some thinking. That's what that little brain is supposed to represent. And then select our drug or um, choose a regimen along with the drug. So regimen being everything about that describes how a drug is given. So we say pick a drug. It's not really just picking the drug, right? You don't just pick penicillin. You say, I'm going to give this dose, this route, this frequency, and this duration. Those are all things that could be varied and could make a difference in terms of um, therapeutic outcome. Um, I teach in a classroom that's sort of like this, only in stadium seating with no uh, aisles. And so um, I'm actually tempted to walk down. I'm not going to walk down the aisle. But if anybody has a comment or a question, there are people, there are um, microphones in the back over here. So just raise your hand, and they'll bring a microphone over. I would prefer that you ask your question in the middle of the session rather than waiting to the end so we can have a conversation at the moment. So please feel free to raise your hand and ask or make a comment. <coughs> so, um, I may be wrong about this, but it's my impression talking with clinicians and practicing veterinarians um, that most of the time you make a drug decision without thinking about what the drug actually, what the effect of the drug is going to be. And I don't mean what the mechanism of the drug is. I mean, what difference do you expect the drug to make in the animal or group of animals in front of you? So that's what we call the treatment effect. So how much difference does the drug make? So animals that aren't treated, 30% of them recover. Animals that are treated, 60% of them recover. Then the treatment effect is the difference between those two, right? Not the 60%. It's 30%. Um, and so the epidemiologists talked about, talk about the estimate of treatment effect. And then I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but I think um, most, most bovine veterinarians, I think, about, think about this um, all the time, and that is population effect. So we don't just think about the mean, we think about the mean and the confidence interval around that mean. Um, and so that's what, what's meant by the measure of precision of the treatment effect. So I think it's probably going to help 30% of the animals that I treat. And I think the range is between 25 and 35. So um, Helen Higgins gave a couple of awesome presentations yesterday um, and talked about and asked some veterinarians about making decisions about um, treatments and thinking about what the confidence interval is around your, how confident are you of that mean that you've, or that drug effect that you've, um, that you're assuming is gonna happen. So um, just some things to think about. I'm not gonna ask you to do any calculations, I'll do just one for you, so, because I'm a pharmacologist, we have to do some. So, um, and I'll show you one peak case slide at the end, so. So um, I picked this, uh, just, it was, a, I was looking for a recent, randomized control trial that was placebo controlled. So this is one of the first um, abstracts I found. So this is about gamithromycin. I don't work for a drug company and I, I'm not supported by one currently, so I didn't pick it for any particular reason. <clears throat> but it was a, a controlled trial and the, this box in red is what I want you to look at, which is that the gamithromycin treated group, 86%, um, and the outcome was um, showed no clinical signs of respiratory disease by 14 days after weaning. So this is metaphylaxis, so we're treating to prevent disease. <clears throat> or control, I suppose, animals at high risk of having respiratory disease. 61% of the placebo-treated animals had no signs of disease. And so the treatment effect is not 86%. Right? The treatment effect is what? Yeah, it's 25%. So the difference the drug made was only in 25% of animals. So one of the ways, um, um, some of you probably um, are familiar with this terminology. How many of you heard a number needed to treat? Great. That's better than the last group I asked, so that's great. Um, and I'm by no means an expert on this measure. It's um, being much more commonly used in human medicine, particularly to compare therapeutics. It's reported much more commonly, um, and I think it's, it's a way we need to be going as in veterinary medicine. Um, and this is just how you calculate it. So the number needed to treat is one over the absolute risk reduction. The absolute risk reduction is what we were just talking about, which is the difference between the treated and the untreated, or the treated and the placebo treated. So in this case, 86% minus 61%, and the inverse of that is four. 
So this is how you interpret the number needed to treat. So <clears throat> you need to treat four calves with gamithromycin, in this study anyway, under these conditions, um, in order to have the desired treatment effect in one animal. So it's a different way of thinking about it. Certainly a lot different than saying 86% success rate, right? Um, and I, that, that's the point I'm trying to make here. There are some diseases um, where the treatment effect is much more dramatic. There are some, what, 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 what commonly treated condition in dairy cows would have a relatively small treatment effect in most cases? Anybody have a good example? Yeah, mastitis, especially staph mastitis, right? The treatment effect is very small. Doesn't mean we don't treat, but the number needed to treat is gonna be relatively high. So um, let me just say there's no, there is no magical number needed to treat. So um, I've seen abstracts of human preventive studies where the number needed to treat was like 25. But we're talking about preventive, and then you start thinking about, well, what are the potential adverse effects of those treatments? Um, is, it, is it worth it to treat 25 people in order to have prevent disease in one? If that disease is a stroke, maybe. If it's a heart attack, maybe so, yeah. So there's no magic number for number needed to treat. It's just an easy way, maybe, if you start wrapping your head around it, of comparing treatments, of thinking about what is it that you're actually doing and spending money on. Yes, Renee? So it, um, the question was, how is treatment success defined? And it depends on the, it's going to depend absolutely on the study that you're looking at. So in this case, treatment success was um, lack of respiratory disease at 14 days. So it's a metaphylaxis study. So uh, that's a great point, which is that treatment effect is defined by whatever the outcomes of the study are. So um, you need to make sure that this is why you read papers. You don't just read the abstract, right? So you find out what the actual measures, outcome measures were that, um, that are associated with that treatment effect. Yeah, so the question is, does it have to be yes or no? Not necessarily. Um, so um, within an individual measure, it would have to be yes, no. So yes, the animals had a lameness of three versus a lameness of one, um, but the proportion of animals is what we're looking at within each of those. So yeah, so continuous variables, you end up having m multiple number needed to treat depending on which point you look at. So it can get really hairy. Like, this is not easy to do, um, necessarily, and it's certainly not easy to ferret out. So um, I gave this presentation, a, or a similar presentation a while ago, and, and I pulled out three or four abstracts, because everybody reads full text all the time, right? So you do a quick PubMed search, cab abstract search, you find three or four abstracts, read the abstract, and you try to pull out the data from the abstract to help you make a decision. Well. A lot of abstracts actually don't have that. It'll say um, uh, gamithromycin traded calves um, had less respiratory disease at 14 days, P less than 0.05. It doesn't really tell you what the treatment effect is. It just tells you that there was one um, or that there was a statistically significant difference between them. So that's a little bit different. So it's a different way of thinking about it and it's a different way. So those of you that are researchers or write papers, um, there might be some areas where you could help clinicians make better decisions by actually reporting those things in an easier way to understand than just, well, they were, they were different. One was more than the other. Therefore, you should use this drug because one was better than the other, and that's probably not adequate. <clears throat> okay, so this is, I'm gonna say A, and you're gonna raise your hand, B, raise your hand, C, raise your hand. I don't wanna mess with the clickers, but um, be honest. How often do you actually think about, not does the, is the drug going to work, but what difference is the drug going to make when you are about to give or direct, write a protocol or whatever? How many of you think of it all the time? Okay. How about about half the time? How about almost never? Yeah, I think... Um, that almost never is probably the rest of you that didn't raise your hand. 
and you didn't want to raise your hand, maybe you said almost never, but no. <laughs> You're still waiting for the translation, maybe. No, um, <clears throat> I think we, um, I, think, I think you think that you think about it all the time, but I'm not sure that you really do. I'm not sure that you go, well, 86% versus 61%. So I'm going to need to treat four calves before I get the effect in one. Maybe you do. That's great. If you do, awesome. <clears throat> but that's where I think we need to be going. Um, and so because we're talking about making decisions about drugs based on information, where do we get our information? Many of us get our information based on our clinical experience, right? We call it clinical impression. We call it, um, we call it whatever you want. But it's what I think happens when I do this thing. When I use this drug, this is what happens. Most of the time, some of the time, all of the time, none of the time. So um, I put this um, traffic light up to remind me to tell you a story about clinical impression, which has nothing to do with veterinary medicine. So um, I was a late bloomer. I didn't go to vet school until I was in my late 20s. I was a psychology major in college. I worked for a law firm for a while, and I worked the night shift for a while. And there was a woman. Um, well, so how many of you have worked night shift anywhere? Yeah, who works night shift? Yeah, I mean, like, what kind of people usually work night shift? You're either students or if you're an adult, maybe you're a little different, right? If you choose to work nights. So <clears throat> this woman was a little different. And we were going home. We were getting ready to leave at the, you know, first thing in the morning. We'd been up all night. And she said, you need to follow me home. This was in Denver, Colorado, big city, lots of tra traffic lights. You need to follow me home. And I said, well, why? Well, she said, because... When I drive, the lights all turn green when I get to them. So that was her. Absolutely, she was convinced that that's what happened because that's what she believed about herself. Confirmation bias, right? She believed that that's what happened, and therefore, every time there was a green light when she was at it, she believed it was her that was. Okay, so, so you laugh, and it's funny, and ha, 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 but that's what we do, right? We see what... We remember what confirms what we already know, and we dismiss the things that don't com don't that conflict with what we think we know about the world or drug therapy or whatever. So that's the um, the essence of evidence-based medicine. <clears throat> I, I found this uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, I just know replaces the systematic review at the top of the evidence pyramid. So this is, um, the spud is kind of like a play on the onion. Some of you are familiar with the onion, which is a satirical newspaper out of Wisconsin. And um, so, you know, the typical pyramid is expert opinion, case series, cohort studies, randomized control trials, systematic reviews, and then um, I just know, which is what this woman who told me to follow her home, she just knew that that was, that was absolutely true. So um, the point is that you can't just know, right? You have to be systematic, and that's the whole point of evidence-based medicine. Um, so <clears throat> the problem is that we want to use our clinical experience, and we should use our clinical experience to help us make decisions, to confirm um, what, what we read in a paper or what a professor told us when we were in school, right? <clears throat> um, and so there's some, really, there's some really good things about personal experience. Um, Personal experience can help you determine what the applicability is of the information. The problem is that the validity of that experience is relatively weak for the most part. So we have to be really careful about how we apply that information. If that's the only information that you use to make a decision, you're probably going to be wrong some of the time. So um, I co-authored a book chapter with Annette O'Connor, who's an epidemiologist who knows way more about this stuff than I do. So I, I took these out of her part of the chapter that she wrote, So because I, th I think they're the most important things to think about when you think about what I remember being true about drugs. Um, and that is, you don't have a comparison group. There's a, a bias when it comes to um, which animals you decided to treat with which drugs. That what, that's what confounding by indication means. means um, Drugs were not randomly assigned to groups. You pick different drugs because they were more severe or less severe um, or some other thing that, that adds a confounding factor to the outcomes. You lose many of those to follow up. <clears throat> I have cats. One of my cats is chewing all her fur off. And so we took her to the vet 
like my husband says, if I just knew a veterinarian that I could that could take care of my animal, I don't know, I don't know anything about cats. So I haven't touched a cat in a veterinary sense since I was in school. So um, she said, well, let's try some Prozac. It's not Prozac. It's whatever the <laughs> kitty version of Prozac is. Um, and I tried it for like three days because I had to pill this cat, right, twice a day. And she was kind of, she wasn't really tolerating the pilling, and she was kind of a little stunned anyway after it. And so I stopped giving it, and I didn't get a refill. So what do you think that veterinarian thinks? She thinks Prozac worked great for my cat because I didn't call her back. So that's lost a follow-up. So the animals that maybe didn't respond, you never hear about. They call another vet, maybe. <laughs> so, and then, of course, um, the whatever outcome measure you might be using to determine success of therapy, if you know that you gave an animal a treatment, this is why blinding is so important, because of the bias associated with um, determining outcome measures if you know who got treatment. So... Those are, there are other things too, but those are the, the most important ones that should make you think, huh, maybe I don't remember as well as I think I do. Now, if you have records, if you follow up on every case, and then you go back through your records, that's not clinical experience. <coughs> that's not clinical impression, that's, that's data. So that's different than just what I think I remember, and every time I've used that, it, it works. So. Um, how many of you have seen this book, Thinking Fast and Slow? How many of you have read this book? Okay, the rest of you need to read this book. It's great. Um, very easy to read. Um, he's a Nobel Prize winner in economics. Don't let that scare you away. Very engaging. There's some uh, YouTube videos also with some short vignettes about some of the things that he talks about. It's about decision making. Um, and the, the theme of, the, of this, this Thinking fast and slow is system one versus system two. Some of you have probably heard about that, right? System one versus system two. System one is the intuitive, automatic. System two is the analytical. Um, and so uh, in the human health field, there have been some investigations into actually in clinical decision making and, um, and what systems are used and how they're used. And I think we need to do more of those in veterinary medicine. I think people are starting to do that. Um, but <clears throat> Experts often use system one, and they're right. Some of the time, most of the time, maybe. Um, veterinary students have to use system two all the time because they're learning everything, so they have to do it systematically and analytically. That's why they take longer to make decisions and to think about things. That's one of the reasons. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's more reliable um, for the most part. But I think this, this deserves some more investigation in, in the veterinary area. This is just a, a more um, detailed discussion as it relates to health decision making. Um, and this is about diagnostics and diagnosis. So um, we talk about pattern recognition and that um, goes into type one versus a pattern that's not recognized. And then so then we have to analyze that and so on. So just a little bit more detailed um, application of the system um, and this cross Gary has written several um, things about that which I a couple of them are here and there's more um, work that he's done on uh, I love this term cognitive debiasing so um, how do you keep yourself from being biased and how do you recognize bias that happens when you're um, assessing your personal experience when it comes to either diagnostics or therapeutics so there's some really interesting reading here Pat Crosscarry, this is in the human field. I think there's a lot of application. Clearly, some work needs to be done in the veterinary field. And so this is how you de-bias. First of all, you have to recognize it's like um, addiction, right? You have, first, you have to recognize that you have a problem. Hi, I'm Virginia. I'm a veterinarian, and I, I trust my clinical impression. <laughs> so... <clears throat> Well, so, and then, but then you say, well, if my clinical impression isn't accurate, then what am I supposed to do? Well, I'm supposed to read papers, except uh, replace newspaper with journal article, right? If you don't read journal articles, you're uninformed. If you do read them, you're misinformed, particularly if you only read the abstract. Um, but the information that you want may not be in there, or the population that you're interested in isn't 
what they studied in the paper. Um, and so we do have to read, but we need to be uh, critical about what we read. Um, this is um, words that mean truth. And um, this is Bob Larson's category of evidence-based um, truth. What's more, what, what do we trust more and what do we trust less? We trust less, we should trust less from someone standing up here telling you, right? Um, we can trust a little bit more um, logical explanations, but those don't always work, right? There's, several, there's a lot of um, examples of that in the human literature and veterinary literature about things we thought were true because they made sense, but they actually, as it turns out, don't make sense. Uh, crib death is the big, the big, one of the biggest examples. Logically, it makes sense that if you put a baby on their stomach, they won't aspirate on their vomit. But, in fact, fewer babies die if you put them on their back when they sleep. So, logically, it doesn't make sense, but that, those are the outcomes. Um, consensus, a little bit better. That's still a bunch of experts all with their own clinical impressions, but if you have enough of them that agree, perhaps it's accurate. And then the scientific method, of course, is our, um, is our gold standard. And so this is the, some of you, um, many of you are familiar with this. Some of you were in presentations yesterday about um, the steps of practicing evidence-based medicine and, and how you go about it. This is just a couple different ways of looking at it. Ask, analyze, appraise, apply, assess. Ask a question, find information to answer that question, apply that information, appraise that information, then apply that information to your patient or group of patients. Um, most of you are familiar with the PICO format, right? Patient intervention comparison outcome. This is how you ask a clinical question. You're not driving down the road thinking, huh, what do I know about Yoni's disease? No, you're driving down the road saying, I'm going to see a client that has a diagnosed cases and now I'm trying to figure out what to do next. So I have a clinical question. I have a diagnostic question. I have a therapeutic question. I have a management question in mind. Um, I'm not just sort of randomly searching for information. So this way you can find the information that you actually really need. Um, I, I put this the picture in here about um, use your library better, um, or use your library often, excuse me. Um, I think use your librarian is what it should say. Those of you that are um, in veterinary schools, you can use your librarian. If you're not in veterinary school, use the librarian that might be um, attached to your association um, RCVS. Um, there are lots of ways to reach a librarian. Librarian isn't someone who catalogs books. Librarians now are information specialists. I just read a commentary yesterday, um, kind of perused it. A physician was talking about not being able to find, or a scientist was talking about not being able to find things and the literature wasn't good and he couldn't get access to this and that and the other thing and he never asked an information specialist. So if he had broken his leg, he would have called an orthopedist. So if he has an information problem, he needs to call an information specialist. So I, I highly recommend that you take advantage of any opportunity you have to work with information specialists to help you find things. Um, I'll put a plug in here for EBVM Learning for those of you that are not familiar with it. Very nice tutorials. And um, then RCVS Knowledge has these toolkits. Um, I have also used a, um, this is a, short version that I use with students on, for critical appraisal of information that's found, really basic questions that are relatively easy to ask. Students can't just read the whole article um, and ask lots of questions, so this is an easy way to appraise and then apply. If anybody's interested, um, I'm happy to send you a copy. Uh, but the main point of the, is to think about what is the risk of bias and our ability to detect the bias in every type of um, study, article, research summary that you read and that's the basis to me of evidence-based medicine is what's the risk of bias? That's what we're looking for. If, if, there's, a, if there's a high potential for bias in a particular source, then we're gonna, we need to trust it a lot less. So that's, what, that's why randomized control trials are good and case series are not as good is because of the risk of bias. So that's the main um, thrust of that pyramid of um, levels of evidence. <clears throat> So the reason we ask a clinical question is that so we know how to, so we know why we're doing this and we're doing this so that we can apply it to a clinical setting. So you answer your clinical question and then uh, make a recommendation. So in the case where our clinical question had something to do with metaphylaxis and gamithromycin, we would apply that evidence to say, um, perhaps, I think I'm gonna use gamithromycin because it made a difference in, um, 
in a percentage of animals, and I and I want it, and my client wants that, and I want that for them. Um, so that's the application. Is it a strong recommendation or a weak recommendation? Uh, maybe on the basis of one paper, I might say it's a weak recommendation. If I had three or four that I found that said the same thing in the same direction, I would perhaps say oh, it's a pretty strong recommendation. Uh, so a little plug here for um, those of you that are involved in research um, that are creating the evidence that clinicians, veterinarians are trying to find, to use, to make decisions. Um, some, this is very brief, thoughts on um, what, putting that, putting your research into an evidence-based medicine context so that what you report in your paper is useful to the clinician. So <clears throat> just a few things here. Um, the first one is um, sort of self-evident, but I think sometimes we ask questions because there's money out there to answer the question, even though I'm not really all that interested in it, but they're going to give me money. Ron Baines, <laughs> they're going to give me money. Um, so it, it's kind of an important question, but I need to write some papers because I'm up for tenure next year, so um, I'm going to attempt to answer that question. Or it's a relatively easy question, inexpensive question, whatever. It may not be an important question. Um, some of you are, are doing research on really important, clinically important questions, and that's great, but we need to continue to do that. We need to use, attempt to use the most unbiased study designs, what we can. You know, we always talk about in therapeutics, we talk about the, the gold standard is uh, the randomized control trial, um, and sometimes those are just really expensive. But if you're going to do other types of study design, you need to think about how to debias those studies as much as you can. Blind the um, investigators. Um, there are lots of ways to do that, but do the best that you can with the um, with the resources that you have. This the third one is you know harks back to what we what I started out talking about, which is actually provide an estimate of the treatment effect. Don't just tell me they were different than each other. One was more than the other, and you know p was less than 0.05. That's not really helpful, particularly if you're comparing drugs, which you often are. Um, most of you are familiar with reporting guidelines. If you're writing, if you're doing research, you need to be using reporting guidelines. So um, consort, reflect, arrive, prisma, these are all, um, and I saw a couple of great meta-analyses or systematic reviews yesterday that used the prisma guidelines. Makes it easy to follow. We see where you, what you did and why you did it. Um, it's a transparent, so I can see where the biases are. And then this last one I think is really important. Not everyone has access to a university library. So if you're, if you're publishing, you need to put it in an open access journal. It needs to be available around the world for free to the user. The user shouldn't have to pay, particularly um, government-supported projects need to be in open access journals. And there are lots of them now, and many of them are they're becoming less and less expensive, and there are some interesting payer models now that um, make it not, um, relatively easy to, to publish in a peer-reviewed but open access. So open access doesn't mean bad. There are really bad open access journals. There are some excellent open access journals. So um, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on this, so our timing is good. Um, and that is uh, to remember that f basic pharmacology is important for some of the decisions that you're going to make. I'm not talking about like the molecular mechanism of action. I'm talking about things like a uh, route of administration and how it's different and what happens to um, and bioavailability of drugs as they're absorbed across through the skin versus um, intramuscularly versus intermammary and what concentrations can you achieve and so on. Um, <clears throat> I use, um, in teaching I use this, we call it the drug decision making map. So most of you have a sort of a map in your head, maybe you don't actually recognize it as a map. Um, but <clears throat> But I think it's a useful way, it's certainly a useful way to, to talk to students about how to make drug decisions. So um, most of you probably, I shouldn't say that, some of you probably took pharmacology from someone who said, okay, today we're going to talk about autonomics, and then next week we're going to talk about NSAIDs, and then week after that we're going to talk about uh, anesthetics. So you talked about it in the context of groups of drugs. Well, that's not really how we use drugs 
out of your truck in your clinic, whatever, right? You don't go, well, let's see, where am I going to use an NSAID today? No, you have a therapeutic need that you need to meet. So that's the essence of this is you start with what's wrong with my patient and what's my goal? What physiology am I going to alter in order to achieve that goal? And then what can I, how can I do that? What drug options are there? How do they work? That's sort of helpful. Um, but really, what are the options? And then I'm going to pick one or another of those, perhaps because of adverse effects, contraindications. And of course, the big one in food animals is legal issues. Is this drug even legal to use? Is it legal to use it the way I want to use it? Is it going to cause a residue? Um, is it going to increase the likelihood of selection for antibiotic resistance? That's not regulated quite yet in, in that manner, but maybe someday it will be. Um, <clears throat> and, then, um, and then we start talking about pharmacokinetics, what things might change if the patient is, has kidney failure, or what if it's a young animal versus an old animal, do I need to change the dose? And then the, the other stuff that you learn about you know, calculating um, doses and so on. And this one is the other really important one that I particularly want students to remember, but I think veterinarians need to remember too, which is kind of what we were talking about earlier, which is follow-up. What's the, how do you, how are you going to know that the drug did what you thought it was going to do? And how are you going to measure that and assess it and keep track of it so that you can use that information to make a better decision next time around? Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, this is just to, to show you what, that there are some basic principles. Um, they're not, this isn't very elegant by any means. This is my version of what are the important things you need to learn in pharmacology as opposed to just the list of drugs you need to learn in pharmacology. So a couple of important examples like concentration matters. You guys think, or like, what? What's that? Well, of course, I knew that, except then you forget it, right? How much drug is there makes a difference. So that seems like a, it's a bedrock pharmacology pr principle that you may or may not have assimilated at some point along the way. It does matter how much you give, and it does matter how long you give it for, because the concentration required to have the effect that you want is important. So that's just an example. Um, uh, affinity of drugs for receptors might influence efficacy. So that's sort of like COX-1 versus COX-2 and understanding those things. So that's the underlying principle there. Yes, sir. I'm going to take you up on your offer <clears throat> to ask a question when it comes to mind. Th this could be a long one. So uh, I struggle with clinical pharmacologists being so married to first principles that they choose to ignore evidence. And the situation where it's most apparent is in the treatment of mild, moderate clinical mastitis. So normally when you set up a trial, uh, you would measure not only clinical cure but bacteriological cure, usually at two time points. Uh, but the underlying principle that clinical pharmacologists have difficulty letting go of is that you should treat for a long time. Uh, and so to the point where if Dr. Ruig, who's a mastitis researcher, he said, she says that in these cases, if you make the decision to treat, to treat for one to three days, the overwhelming industry acceptance is that you would treat for much longer than that, even though in the clinical trials you measure bacteriological cure, usually at two time points. And when I talk to clinical pharmacologists, they all sort of nod their head that you should treat for longer than one to three days. Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up because that is a, one of those, uh, that's a, there are a number of those out there. That, that's a dogma of pharmacologists and also clinicians. Um, talk to a small animal internist about treating UTIs, right? And there's, we do this many days because that's what we do and that's what we've always done. And there's data in the literature that says we should do it for this many days. Well, the data in the literature said when we did it for 21 days, we had this percent success. It didn't say, but if we only did it for 10, it was less. They just, so there are very few comparative studies of um, duration of therapy. That one you will not find on my important list of principles. So that may be true of other pharmacologists, but it, it's definitely not true for me. And I think it depends on, I mean, that's the whole point about decision making is to use the evidence to support. But the problem is, what you're talking about is for, for maybe for mastitis, there's some good evidence. For other conditions, we have less evidence to support one duration over another. There, there's, there's evidence that says if we do it for seven days, this is what we get. But there is an evidence that says, but if we only did it for three or we did it for 12, we got different results. So, uh, great question. Um, and then I, this is the 
more or less the last thing that I think everybody in this room knows that we always, this is kind of in the forefront of most of our minds, um, but I think it uh, deserves reminding is that um, uh, if we're treating cattle, they're food animals. They're food products coming from them. Um, and so withdrawal times, uh, food safety, all of those things are things that I'm just, I'm up here as a pharmacologist and I have to say these things because I, I, I say them all the time to maybe nobody in this room, other veterinarians, and they say, well, it's not going to, well, it's not really, it's a, it's a, it's a pet, it's a, da, 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 da. it's a food animal, it's a food animal, it's a food animal, these are food animals. So that's, um, that should be high on your list of um, considerations when it comes to making decisions about drugs for cattle. That's just saying that again. It's not just about withdrawal time. Also, it's about meat quality. This is injection site kinds of things. We talk about that a lot in the US about meat quality. Maybe someday we'll talk about antibiotic resistance, not residues, selection for resistance. I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying maybe we'll, we'll go there. Um, and then a final, this isn't really a principle, and, and people have alluded to this in other presentations in, during this meeting, and that is science is awesome, but politics rule. So yesterday in the antibiotic resistance um, session, um, they were talking about we're not worrying about whether we're decreasing resistance. We're just we're just talking about reducing antibiotic use because we want to be able to say we're doing something. So that's not science. That's politics. So sometimes that's what drives what we do and how we make decisions. So, so we have a couple minutes for questions. Okay. Yeah. Well done. Comments? Maybe I could start by asking you about, um, in the way we teach pharmacology in UCD, they, they, we teach your principles. The students are a bit bored. But when we put exa veterinary examples in and case studies in within that and integrate it, then they get much more interested. And yeah. they come back in later years when they're doing the clinical stuff. And then they say, well, we're much more interested in mechanism of action of how these things work now. Yeah, so um, I don't present the list of principles and they learn them all and then we do the drugs. Yeah. The, those are all actually embedded into, mm. okay, so this week we're going to talk about reducing pain, which of the principles actually apply to the drugs that, that we talk about when we mm. talk about reducing pain. So, um, because I used to do that, I used to do, you know, three weeks of all the grand prints, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, la, 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 and the students mm. would be like, yeah, 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 did well on the test, Whoosh, it's gone. And then later they'd forget that concentration is important, for example. So. Mm. Now I kind of embed all those within as we're talking about the drugs. So, and I think, uh, and I have plans for this fall, I have a new co-instructor, and so we're working on some case studies to do exactly those things to emphasize the principle, not just the drugs. It's hard for second year students to, they think if they just memorize the drugs, then they're, they're all the way there. Um, but we'll, we'll try, so. Other question, yeah. Um, Hang on, he's bringing the microphone. Thanks. Michael McGowan, University of Queensland, um, Australia. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, my, my, my comment is that uh, the, the decision making with regards the, the, the treatment that we uh, prescribe uh, is, is I, I think, incredibly complex. And uh, it often uh, comes down to issues such as ease of administration and frequency of administration. So um, in my practice, uh, I, I deal with a lot of bulls, uh, tropically adapted bulls. They, they, they hate needles. Uh, so uh, in, in cases of seminal vesiculitis, uh, the, the, the treatment we used to use was um, multiple injections of erythromycin. Uh, by the second injection, uh, the bull was uh, saw me coming. Uh, so the change, and, and was to a long-acting macrolide that could be administered small volume uh, subcutaneously. And that, and, and so, you know, th that's just an example of how you know, w we knew that erythromycin was uh, the drug of choice, it, lipophilic, likely to penetrate, and there was, we had follow-up evidence. But the decision to go to another was entirely about other factors. Except you started with it worked. 
right? Yes. I mean, you started with, with that, with the, it's effective or it has a treatment effect that's useful. And by the way, also it is yes. long acting and we only have to give one injection. That's right. So you didn't start with, I have a long acting drug, what can I do with it, right? Correct. Right, okay. So yeah, yeah so that, so the, the decision tree I showed you is, is relatively simplified for second year pharmacology students. It doesn't include things like economics and logistics and those things like you're talking about, withdrawal time if you're, you know, treating dairy cows. So those are, yeah, I agree, those are, those are all part of it, but you have to, you're not gonna pick a long acting drug because it's a long acting drug if it doesn't have a desirable treatment effect, right? Yeah, yeah. so, so the, this concept of understanding, which is what you've uh, talked about there, understanding a macrolide, if I'm dealing with, say, glandular tissue, I'm going to get good penetration. That's my starting point. And then I look at other right. factors. Right, right. Thank you. We're going to have to move on because we're into the next speaker session. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.